So uh, last session was uh, personally for me incredibly valuable. I know that there were a lot of questions in the room which we couldn't answer because of time. Uh, there's two or three thoughts I want to leave you with. One is that in uh, the evening there will be a, a young guy over here by name of Vivek Pandit. Uh, the incredible thing about Vivek is that he is an author and he has a distinct honor of having written a book on Gen Z's uh, as a Gen Z himself. So he's the first Gen Z author to write a book about Gen Z. Now the reason I share this with you, uh, he makes a statement and the statement Vivek makes is, is that he's talking about his parents, his grandparents and the generations that came prior to that. Uh, prior to them, and he calls them a silent generation. And the reason this is important to point out is, is because while it may not give us all the answers to the solutions we are looking for as parents and grandparents as to how do we inspire our next generation, the moniker that Vivek uses certainly is a hint of what we can do different. So I just wanted to point that out. The second thing I wanted to say is that, again, this is, uh, there's a reason why this is a two-day conference and not a two-hour conference. And the reason is so that we can keep asking those questions as we mingle over coffee and lunch and dinner and social and dance and breakfast again tomorrow. So we have a lot of time. Please use it wisely uh, to interact with uh, the panelists. I think we have all of them uh, except for Mona uh, over here. So without any further delay, uh, let me get started with our next session, uh, which is about how to influence legislation and public policy. Now, the person that will be educating about how to be influential in public policy is Ron Tom. And I want to make sure I introduce Ron, Ron the way I think he needs to be introduced to this, to this gathering. So Dr. Ron Tom, who is on stage with me over here, working in the political arena in a variety of positions. He has represented the firm's wide array of clients which include Fortune 500 companies and health industries before the California legislature. Thank you, Rajiv. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm going to take you with me everywhere I go and let you do a 10-minute intro of me. Uh, most people know me in the political arena and in the Asian community arena as just mainly Tom's husband. And when I go to events, I generally sit in the back in the corner quietly and people come by and say, who are you and what do you do? I said, I'm mainly Tom's driver and that usually suffices. I want to congratulate all of you for being here because you made it back. I'm in the unenviable position of being after the break and before the lunch. But I see that you're all back, you're all paying attention, and if I see anybody scooting off for an early lunch, it's not being served till much later. What is lobbying? What does the word lobbying mean? Lobbying is very simple. I'm going to break it down and demystify it for you today very quickly. Uh, all it is is getting someone else to understand and take the same position that you have on something. Lobbying is like sales. Instead of selling a product, you're selling an idea, a philosophy, a policy, public policy, an issue. And everybody's done that. So right now it's a little audience participation time. Raise your hand if you have ever lobbied. Oh, I'm impressed. I'm really impressed. Everybody here should have their hand up because everybody has been a lobbyist. Let's use a fancy term, advocate. When you were little and your parents wanted you to have vegetables and you wanted to have pizza and you wound up having pizza, you were a lobbyist. You won. When they wanted you to go to bed about 8 o'clock at night and you wanted to stay up and watch something on television or work, continue working on your video game, and you stayed up till nine, you won, you're a lobbyist. So everybody's done it. They didn't know they did it. Uh, you, uh, what I want you to do after today is continue doing what you did as a kid, only we're gonna fine tune it a little bit. 
And some people like to define advocacy as uh, non-professional lobbying. They look at lobbyists as professional people. And I was at a podcast recently, or, and somebody asked a question about how do you defend the profession of lobbying because it's not viewed very highly. Well, I take a friend each at that. Uh, I think it is an honorable profession, otherwise I would not have done it for 25 or 30 years. Because I am an honorable person, that speaks for itself. Uh, what are the issues that are confronting us today that everybody needs to take a portion of their own critic of who they are, where they're going, and what they want to do, what their lifestyle is? Second question, audience participation. How many of you have been victims of either verbal or physical abuse defined as Asian hate? That's too bad. <laughs> That's really bad. There is one overarching issue today that confronts all Asians in America, and that's Asian hate. You've heard speakers speak about it before. There are organizations nationally, my wife's been working with them very intimately, about how do we stop this? When do we stand up and say, enough is enough? Strike back. Let's stand up for ourselves because lesson number one in lobbying, who does it? You do. Why? Because nobody else will do it unless you do it. If you sit there passively and let people define who you are, or hoping that one of your brethren, your sisters or brothers, somebody else is going to stand up and defend you on this very important major issue, it may not get done. It takes all of us. Hillary Clinton says it takes a village. I think it takes an entire uh, population. The Asian population needs to stand together and stand tall. Okay. What are the qualities of being a lobbyist? Number one, stand up, speak out, represent, engage in politics, become visible. Number one skill in being an advocate, a lobbyist, confidence, self-confidence. If you can't stand up, you can't defend your people, you can't defend yourself, you will not be a lobbyist, you will not be an advocate. You have to be able to stand tall, speak up, be strong, and be able to take hits. You have to be able to take defeats. Not every battle you go into will be won by you. Politics has been described as a contact sport. I've also heard it be stated that it's a knife fight inside of a telephone booth. It's up close and personal. A lot of the attacks today politically, we see that social media. We see it in mass media. We see that on emails. We see that in text messages. They're anonymous. It's safe for people to attack us because we don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. But real politics, real lobbying, and I'm going to segue into how to be successful in passing legislation, is up close and personal. Lobbying is not done by email, it's not done by text messaging or telephone calls or by social media, by Twitter or Facebook. Is Mona still here? No, Mona's gone. Or by Facebook. It's done up close and personal. Looking at somebody in the eye and telling them what you would like them to do and explaining and educating them on how to do that. That is your job. You can't be passive. In the Asian community, the culture is against us. I think uh, Professor Russell Jung said, America needs to be more Asian. I always say this, Meili says this, Asians need to be less Asian. Our culture is a detriment to us being strong advocates for who we are. We don't stand up for ourselves. We don't speak out. We're passive. We're told, turn the other cheek. Don't make waves. I know you all heard this term. It's a great term, and I'm going to go against it. Don't be the nail that sticks up. If your parents tell you that, my parents told me that. I didn't listen to them, of course. Here I am as a lobbyist. You want to be that nail. You want to stand up. You want to speak out. They hit you down, you come back up again. And you do it over and you over and over again until you're successful in what your mission is. 
You have to be confrontational. You have to like combat. You have to get in somebody's face. If they're disagreeable and they don't agree with you, you have to tell them with the right message, the right style, and the right demeanor of how you get your idea and your thought across. And that's basically all it takes to be a lobbyist or an advocate. And how do you get started? You participate in the political process. Again, I say don't let somebody else do it for you because it won't get done. You've heard people today, they've talked about how they got involved, how they engage, what they're doing. Take that as an example of following their trail. They're setting the trail for you. My wife's been doing it for 40 plus years. She broke the glass ceiling. She set trails. Follow her. That's why I'm her driver. Find a mentor. That mentor could be a legislator, legislative staff, a lobbyist, uh, somebody who works in the community, a community activist or an act, uh, advocate. Join a community organization. There are a large number of Asian community organizations, local, national, statewide. Find one, join up. Ask somebody for help. Say, I want to participate in the political process. I think I need to go out and help you to help myself, to help my people achieve this goal and to keep the eye on the ball, focus on Asian hate, other issues too. I mean, the other issues facing us every day. Uh, we left Sacramento yesterday and I saw the news, same ongoing theme, homelessness. They're gonna put a homeless tent city right across the street from where you live. Those are the kind of local issues you can get involved in, so not all issues have to be Asian-based, but let's make sure that we resolve our own Asian issues first. Didn't take a lot of skills, as I mentioned, to do what we do. All you have to do is be committed. Uh, I'm gonna segue into a little happier subject now. There we are, that's all of us, every one of us, hands in the air, fighting for the, the good fight. Next slide. There we are again, what's your issue? It doesn't have to be all Asian, it could be something that affects education, healthcare, homelessness. Then you find out that it's more important to go out there and do something. Instead of just ranting and raving and rallying and have the demonstrations, that's all good, that works. Then you take the next step. You become the advocate for that issue. Uh, okay, here's my segue issue. We all know what that is? Chinese roast duck. Who ever thought Chinese roast duck would be the biggest, hottest issue in the California legislature in 1982? I mean, what has a roast duck to, done to anybody to irritate them and make them angry that they want to mount a campaign against Chinese roast duck. 1982, Los Angeles County Health Department decided to raid Chinese restaurants, Chinese delicatessens, confiscate these ducks, fine the owners of those restaurants and delis $150 per duck. The large delis and restaurants sold probably two to 300 ducks per day. Do the math. They couldn't afford to pay that. What's going on? Why are they attacking us? What's the basis of their, of their uh, attacks and raids into the restaurants? <clears throat> A very old law sitting in the California books, Food and Safety Clause says, prepared food must be sold in either a refrigerated unit below 40 degrees centigrade. You ever buy a roast duck that's been in the refrigerator for a while and bring it home and eat it? It's not the same, is it? Skin is kind of hard and rubbery and tough. The fat congeals. It's not a good thing. The other part of the law says you could sell it, but you have to keep it in an enclosed cabinet over 140 degrees temperature. You keep roast duck in a, an oven like that for a couple hours before it's sold, you're looking at duck jerky. We never find out the genesis of the idea of attacking Chinese restaurants and confiscating roast duck. The Chinese Restaurant Association of Los Angeles County got together, had a meeting, decided that something had to be done. Enough was enough. 
they were a little politically savvy because they knew they needed to go to the legislature, find a champion, and introduce some legislation that was going to amend the state food and safety code on selling roast duck. Perfect timing. A new young assemblyman in Los Angeles, assemblyman Art Torres, represented Chinatown, Japantown, Koreatown, and also East LA, which is largely Hispanic. He also happened to be chair of the Assembly Health Committee at the legislature. Good place to be if you're gonna be doing health bills. The Chinese Restaurant Association went to Sacramento, sat down, met with him, presented their problem. They had already gotten their act together, so they had the issue, they had a message. Why us? What's wrong with roast duck? Ironically, there was a new consultant on the health committee who happened to be Chinese, and Mr. Torres included this consultant in on the meeting with the Chinese Restaurant Association. They formulated legislation, simple, a little amendment to the State Food and Safety Codes, Health and Welfare Code 1257-3A. Chinese roast duck shall be exempt from the Health and Safety Codes for the purpose of retail sales, exempt from heating and cooling in the retail establishment. Simple. The bill took off. Okay, what next do you do? You look for allies, you look for friends, you look for people that can help you. The Chinese Restaurant Association went out into the Los Angeles area, mobilized all the Chinese organizations. <clears throat> all the other organizations came along too because they were fearful if they could knock off the Chinese restaurant people, which is one of the largest ethnic restaurant associations in Los Angeles, they could take on the Koreans, uh, the Japanese, and the Vietnamese, and the Filipinos. Got all the Asians together. Get your friends together. Who else? They went to San Francisco. Large Chinese population of San Francisco and said to them, they're attacking us in LA. You'll be next. If they're successful, you will be next. San Francisco mobilized their people, went out in the community, they got all the restaurant people, they got the retail businesses, they got all the other Asian organizations, just like Los Angeles, and they got them all together. And they had a little extra going for them in San Francisco because the then governor of California, Jerry Brown, in his first term, he's from San Francisco. He and his family are very close to the Chinese community in San Francisco. He had had roast duck, he knew what it was all about. He agreed when the Chinese representatives went to his office in Sacramento and said, Mr. Governor, we need your help on this. He said, absolutely. I would never think of eating cold roast duck or overheated roast duck. The bill started to move. It became a media darling. The Chinese Restaurant Association, they recruited media. Now back in those days, they didn't have social media, they didn't have emails, they didn't have text messages. It was the old school kind of thing. It was just newspapers, radio, TV, word of mouth. They got to the ethnic press, all the Chinese newspapers started to blast this. Uh, they went to the, to the modern media, Los Angeles Times. They put editorials in there weekly about this legislation that Mr. Torres was moving. Media, community, everybody. Southern California, Northern California. This bill took flight. Then the governor came out and he made a public statement. If this bill reaches my desk, I will sign this. This is going to be a righteous thing to do for the, this food product that, I mean, in 5,000 years of making and selling Chinese roast duck, who has it ever heard? Have you heard about mass food poisonings? Not at all. Well, with the imprimatur of the governor saying, I like this bill, I'm going to sign this bill. It flew out of the Assembly, it flew out of the Senate, it got signed and became law. Let's reflect for a second here. What happened? Message, people got together, they got friends, they got allies. How many have read the book, The Art of War by General Sun Zhu? I expected more. That book is a blueprint for politics. It talks about what we just did. So if you haven't read the book, you want to get into politics, it's actually required reading in political science and, uh, all the, and it's actually required reading in a lot of the financial institutions as you go through Horton School of Business because that book tells you 
a, a basis of how to run politics. Message, friends, allies, chart your course, know what you're doing. And that's how we, we beat a bill. Next slide. Okay, who's that handsome young man on the left? That would be Assemblyman Art Torres. And who's that really handsome man on the right with all that hair? That would be me. Yes, I was the consultant on the health committee, 1982, that was given the job of doing the roast duck bill. Shortly thereafter, Amelia and I were in San Francisco shopping, walking down Stockton Street, stopped into a deli to bring some food home. Uh, after a trip and a weekend there, the owner recognized me. We had so much food he gave us for free to take home. That was great. It didn't last very long. The next time I went in there, he forgot who I was. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But I want to say to you, again, we started with something very serious, ended with something kind of fun and funny, but it illustrates and demonstrates what we can do when we work together. And let me tell you, there's nothing more powerful when we put all our voices together, all our energy together, we will overcome and we will beat it. Let's all get together again, and you're going to hear it the rest of, the, of this conference, I think. Let's work on resolving, stopping Asian hate. And I think at this point in time, well, I'm going to invite the better looking half of my family up here to join me. And we're going to have a little family chat. Unfortunately, our daughter could not make it. Uh, she will illustrate how it's generational because our daughter now is working in the state legislature. She's chief consultant to the Asian caucus uh, in the Capitol, representing the assembly and members and the Senate members who are Asian. And our grandson is now in his uh, third year of college. And guess what his major is going to be? Political science. Three generations. So thank you, Ron.